Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Refugee Populations, People and Ideas on the Move. My name's Stacy. I'm part of the Classy Design team, and I am so, so excited to introduce this panel to you guys. I wish you guys were backstage with us so you could have seen the conversations that were happening, but hopefully we get to have a taste of that here. Um, political instability, um, political turmoil has been a constant on the world stage. Unfortunately, what hasn't changed much is our ability to help and protect the people on the ground, the communities who are most affected. You guys have been following the news in Syria and felt like, you know, if, if only there was someone who could, um, rest assured you guys are in for a really big treat. The people on this stage are the people who are not only working to support, but to empower people in crisis. So we're really thankful to have Jay Corliss from the UN Foundation who came in last minute to be here with us, so thank you. Um, Ali Aljundi from Oxfam America, Corrine Gray from UNHCR, the UN Refugee Foundation, and Lena Attar from Crown Foundation who's actually a Classy Awards finalist, so congratulations to you. Um, enjoy. So, my mic on? Yeah. Well, a welcome, first of all, I want to welcome everyone here. This is um, a very exciting moment for all of us uh, here to come and share our work with you and, and talk about something that's very important to us. Um, as as uh, Stacy mentioned, I came in very last minute. They, they said, Jay, you know, would you mind moderating a panel on um, refugee, refugee populations, people ideas on the move? And my first thought was, you know, we need to highlight that these are resilient people. Um, and that's something that we need to start caring, um, thinking about. So it should be resilient people and ideas on the move. And our panelists will talk more and more about uh, resilience. Um, secondly, we're facing, uh, with, with the crisis we're looking at, this is the challenge of a generation. And it's very, very good to see social entrepreneurs thinking about these challenges. Um, at the UN, we deal with a whole variety of challenges. But you are the people that are coming up with the ideas and methodologies to solve these problems. What we're going to talk about, um, we're talking about with people that are inspiring people. They have the courage and willingness to take on these issues. And many of the issues you're taking on um, also inspire us. And, and there's you know, something that I picked up in my career, and it's the, the notion of solidarity. And it's the, the idea that as humans, we stand shoulder to shoulder with each other to move forward and tackle solutions, and develop solutions and tackle problems. Um, so just very quick thoughts on, on what we're going to be talking about. And just think about that idea of solidarity. Um, as social entrepreneurs, that's something very important to us. Myself, I'm, I'm director of innovation for the UN Foundation. I have essentially two roles. I'm a cheerleader. Um, I look for innovations. I look for people that are changing the world. And um, I'm there to tell you, yes, we can. Si se puede. Um, and provide that enthusiasm whenever you're feeling down. Second, I'm a coach. Um, I assemble and build teams around um, innovations to, to help you scale and scale your ideas. So that's just kind of my role here, and I work with these folks, uh, and I'll work with them much more um, to, to kind of do their stuff. What, what we're here for, really, I just want to take you through a quick thought exercise. As entrepreneurs, there's a whole series of numbers and issues um, that we could go about about this crisis. But I just want to take you as entrepreneurs through a quick thought exercise. There's one number we really need to think about. That's 60 million displaced persons. 60 million. That's the size of France. That's the population of France, population of England. We're talking about entire countries, the population of an entire country. The challenge in front of us is really thinking about the global humanitarian system. Now, what these people do is that they take that challenge of 60, 60 million people and they develop public works, roads, bridges, transportation systems, health and sanitation, right? Education and capacity, schools, clinics, livelihoods, businesses. We want to get these people working again. Stores, services, groceries, entrepreneurs, governance. How do you make a decision in these situations? So as entrepreneurs, Think about that. Think about these 60 million people and think about that system, that system that's needed to manage this. But it's not in one geographic location. It's in a variety of geographies. 
It's in a variety of cultures. It's in a variety of languages. So your solution that may work in one geography needs to be replicated in a second, in a third, in an area. So this is literally one of the biggest challenges we have. Think about that. Now come up with a budget. How much do you think that costs? How much do you think it costs to provide basic services to 60 million people? A budget. Think about it. Now cut that exponentially and cut it again and cut it again. That's what these people are facing. Add to that political instability. A very difficult political situation just about in every one of their environments. And remember, these have to be sustainable ventures. So what service are you thinking about? Where are you going to deploy your groundbreaking technology? Are you in a camp? Because some of these people are in camps. Some of these are in urban settings. Some of them are in rural settings. Some of them, we don't even know where they are. But we know they exist. Importantly, have you designed your solution with their feedback? Or have you just created it outside of their context altogether? How are you feeling right now? You feeling kind of hopeless? You feeling like it's an impossible task? Don't. These are the heroes, just like your heroes. We're taking this on. We're taking this on because it can be done because solutions exist. That was the global. Let's zoom into us. Let's zoom into your geography. Syria. There are 4.7 million Syrian refugees. One, over 1 million in Lebanon, over 650,000 in Jordan, 250,000 went to Iraq, over 2.5 million in Turkey, and there's 6.6 .6 within the Syrian borders. Children, mothers, daughters, professionals, educated people, trying to make a life for themselves. I want to introduce you to my colleagues and, and, and the people that you've really come to listen to. And I want to open up a conversation with them um, so they can share their work with you and tell you um, about what they're doing. They haven't given up hope. They confront these issues on a daily basis. They're on the front lines. They're building businesses. They're creating impact. They're hustling. They're hustlers. They're making deals. They're creating opportunity where none exist. Their specialty, we're going to talk about two things very specifically. Creating innovations to reach people who can't be on the move. Those people that aren't moving, who are stuck in remote and difficult locations. Number two, they're creating innovations to serve large volumes of refugees in and around this geography that I described in Syria. We're going to start with Lena. I'm just going to run through very quickly. Lena's from the Karam Foundation, based in, founded in 2007. Karam means generosity in Arabic. She's going to talk to us a little about, about education and smart aid approach. And in the middle, we've got Corrine. Corrine and I, we've, we've worked for almost two years together now. Um, she's from UNHCR. A post-war, Second World War ended. UNHCR was created. It was given a three-year mandate to resettle the populations devastated by the Second World War. That mandate was extended and extended and extended and extended, and we're still here today dealing with the largest refugee crisis we have, and UNHCR is part of that. Ali from Oxfam. Oxfam is also an organization. Second World War, they stands for the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief. They busted through naval um, barricades to deliver food to women and children. He's going to talk about the value, they share a value of women and girls and community water projects. <clears throat> That's enough for me. Lena, talk to us a little so bit more. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for, for all of you for coming to this panel. Um, my name is Lena Sergi Attar, and I'm Syrian American. Uh, I live in Chicago, but I lived half of my life in the US and the other half in Aleppo, which is the largest city in Syria, one of the oldest cities, uh, continuously inhabited cities in the world. 
and my city has been almost completely destroyed over the last five years. Um, so for us as Syrians, we feel that the world, with all of these numbers that you spoke about, the world has largely forgotten about the scale of loss that Syrians have suffered. So when I come to panels and talks like these, and I see a, a large group of people that come because they care about refugees and they care about Syrians, it really is a huge honor and I thank you for caring and I thank you for trying to be part of the solution because we need so many people to be part of the solution in this problem. Um, Karam Foundation is an organization I co-founded in Chicago in 2007. Karam means generosity in Arabic, and when we started, it had nothing to do with Syria at all. It was more about helping local communities in Southside Chicago, helping Iraqi refugees resettle into Boston, and helping international organizations. In 2011, uh, when the humanitarian crisis began in Syria, we had to refocus our entire organization and Karam basically became my life. Um, I, I was trained as an architect. I don't work as an architect. I do Karam full time now. And we think about Syria and the people that we serve 24-7. Um, the scale of the destruction of the people that have been left behind inside Syria and the refugees is extremely overwhelming. When you're talking about millions of people, it feels like for an organization like ours and even an organization like UNHCR, it feels like impossible to be able to make an impact. And for us as Syrians, as being so close to the problem and the conflict, uh, that's a kind of balance that we, our team has to make every day between looking at the large picture, knowing, for instance, in the last 48 hours, Aleppo has been bombed over 100 times, and other areas, in, there's over 1 million people in besieged areas in Syria that are starving to death because starvation is being used as a war crime. And at the same time, people are drowning every day trying to get to Europe. And the kids that we work with in Turkey are another day, facing another day without going to school and in, are in child, child labor instead. That's the big picture is devastating. But the other side of it is that all of us can make an ex, a very deep impact when we focus on a certain issue. And for us at Karam, we've decided to focus on a specific area, which is in southern Turkey on the Syrian-Turkish border. And we chose a town that is, has a population of about 60,000 people um, that are Syrian refugees and 30,000 that are from the town itself that are Turkish. And so we go to that town twice a year and we do innovative education missions. And what we do is we take a large group of people just like yourselves who are experts at a specific field and we go and we um, intervene in Syrian refugee schools for about a week and we do um, creative therapy, arts, sports, journalism. Um, for the teenagers we do technology and entrepreneurship workshops. We do a full physical wellness um, portion that includes dental hygiene, dental clinics, vision screening, and over the course of a week, what happens in these schools is that the kids, the teachers, the administration feel unabandoned. They feel a group of people that are mixed between people who are originally Syrian, people who are coming from around the world, traveled and came to tell them that you're not invisible, we care about you. The kids get inspired, the kids be gravitate towards specific skills, and the end outcome is kids who are more confident, kids who are more creative, they remember the world, they remember that they don't, they're not living in isolation, and with the best, one of the best things is for the teenagers that we're able to start be, to build skills that they could use to build their own futures. Because our goal is to build a better future for Syria despite the despair. Because these people, as you know, many refugees may never return to their homelands. But they need to understand that they still can become productive and powerful citizens in their host communities and wherever they end up calling home for the long term. <coughs> so this is the kind of work we do. We do a lot of work inside Syria in terms of humanitarian aid and emergency aid. And we also, what we call the entire um, umbrella of what we do is smart aid. 
because after working in this field now uh, full time for five years in this in, in a crisis and in a conflict zone, uh, smart aid is something that everybody needs to be practicing. It means that to do aid that's long term, sustainable, community driven, meaning people drive the aid, not the organizations drive the aid to the people, and it needs to have a deep impact that lasts for a very long time so that we're able to have refugees thrive instead of just surviving. So that's the kind of work we do. Thank you, Lena. I think there's, <clears throat> for, for the social entrepreneurs in the room, and when we start to look at our situations, we start to deal with the issue of scale. <clears throat> and what, what Lena is referring to is this, this type of how do we tap into the pipelines of aid and the smart aid to help our organizations achieve scale. Um, many of your organizations are smaller in nature, and Lena's is a, is a small organization. So it's very interesting in this panel that we have a small organization, and, and um, Corinne is going to talk to us a little bit more about how we achieve scale and how UNHCR facilitates scale through private sector partnership. Uh, so there's two ways. Smart aid is um, overseas development assistance, which many of you may be able to tap into, and scale through private sector um, partnerships. So, Corinne, if you could walk us through a bit, UNHCR and, and private sector partnerships. Thank you, Jay, and thank you to our panelists, and thank you to Classy for, for introducing us and welcoming, welcoming us here. Also very heartwarming to see that this is actually something on your panel. You know, how many ever years ago, refugees was not something that everyone was talking about, but, but now it is. And the fact that each and every one of you is here in this room says to me that you want to learn more about the issue, but hopefully, I hope that you also are here because you want to figure out what can you do as individuals, as entrepreneurs, as citizens of this planet. I think facing what we now think of as the largest refugee crisis since World War II, each and every one of us has a role to play. And I think the key is figuring out where can I fit in? Just to give you a bit of background, I, I work for the UN Refugee Agency, so we are the agency that was mandated to, to protect refugees. And I work in a particular unit called the, the Innovation Unit. And it's funny because many people think there's nothing at all innovative about the UN, and when you say the words UNHCR innovation, people think of it as an oxymoron. But a lot of what we do is, is tied to what Jay talked about in the beginning, the fact that you have a massive crisis, you have millions and millions of displaced people, and behind each of those numbers is an actual human being like yourself with a family and a job, et cetera. But we also have less resources to do that. And so innovation for us is really that tool to enable us as an organization to do much more with less. And this is where partnerships and collaboration really come into play. We really recognize that as the agencies that deal with this work, we obviously cannot do it on our own. And we know that for each of the challenges that we have, there probably is already someone in the private sector or there probably is an entrepreneur out there who already has this solution. The key for us is how do we make those challenges and those solutions come together? We're not out trying to create new things. One of the things that we want to do is we want to find the solutions that we already exist, and then we want to think about how do we adapt this <coughs> to the challenges that are being faced by forcibly displaced people all over the world. Uh, the other day, I, I was at a, an event, and I, I met a, a Syrian refugee who had, you know, came to Europe via boat, and he was just sharing the story and the experience of being on the boat. And one of the things he said to me that really stood out was, you know, I looked at the boat and I looked as we drifted ashore and I looked around me and he said, I cried because I realized Syria is leaving. And what he meant by that is he's looking at his entire country leaving. And I think one of the greatest tragedies of any refugee crisis is the loss of human capital. And it's something that we don't think about a lot. You know, at, at my job, at my desk, I see numbers all the time. 
But one of the things we don't really do a lot of is understanding who's behind those numbers and understanding the sheer loss of human capital that happens in tragedies like this. And something that we have to remember is that refugees were everyday people. They had lives in Syria. You know, they had jobs, they are educated, they have capacities, they have skills. But they're now in a situation where they can't use those skills anymore. They're in a situation where they don't know what their future is going to look like anymore. And so one of the key things that we look at is how do we bring as much dignity and normalcy into these lives as, as possible. What we have found with, with refugee populations is there are some very key challenges, and these are the challenges that any human would face in a similar situation. First of all is, is language. Of course, you're moving to a new place. If you don't know the language, that automatically places you at a huge disadvantage because language is like currency. There are very few things that you can do without having the language. Education is a big one for us. Uh, UNHCR actually incorporates education as part of its first response, and we prioritize it as much as we prioritize food and shelter. And one of the main reasons for that is you have a lot of, of children and young people whose education get completely displaced. They were in school before crisis and after crisis, they are literally left with nothing to do all day. And as I said, loss of human capital has massive repercussions for, for future generations. So we look very much at how can we bring educational experiences and access to education because they should be able to continue their education. It also gives a sense of empowerment because these people are now tasked with creating a new society with nothing essentially and from scratch. And so education is really important to keep that human capital from being lost. Livelihoods is also a big one. Um, as Lena mentioned, you know, we see on the news lots of people fleeing. What we don't know and what we don't understand and what we don't grasp is that conflicts can last several years. You know, the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya will turn 25 years old this year. So there are people who've been born in the camp, they've gotten married, there are generations. And something we have to think about is with all of these people on the move who are now creating new homes, these are the solutions we have to be thinking about. What kind of futures will they have in the countries that they've been resettled into? And making sure that they have access to livelihoods is a very, very key part of that. Because you find with, with urban refugees, you move to a new place, you don't have the language, you don't have the income, the problems that you're going to have basically mimic the problems of the urban poor. And that cascades into a lot of different complications for the family. Then another important challenge as well is making sure that there's access to information. So for people who are on the move, they need accurate information and they need accurate information now and in a timely and trustworthy format. So our unit looks at a lot of these different challenges and we recognize that within ourselves, we cannot come up with the answers. So we work very closely with the private sector. For example, for, for education, like I said, which is very important for us, we are currently working with Vodafone Foundation. Um, and they've been helping us to, first of all, boost connectivity in, in some of the camps, but they've also been helping with introducing technology into the classroom. But built onto that is really capacity building for, for teachers. It's not just throwing tablets into the classroom, but it's really helping teachers to build their capacity. Because in a lot of schools and camps, you will have sometimes one teacher having to deal with hundreds and hundreds of students in one classroom. So these are very sort of real on the ground challenges. So we worked with Vodafone Foundation and we've done a fantastic project with them called the Instant Network Schools that really looks at how we can bring connectivity and connect classrooms around refugee camps. Another example of, and, and since then we've been able to roll out 13 of their Instant Network classrooms um, across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we have worked with IKEA Foundation to, who basically put some money up to create a new um, social enterprise that would design and build a better shelter using sort of this flat pack technology um, that IKEA has mastered so well. 
Another example of, of how we've worked with the private sector is specific to the Syria crisis. We had a very huge issue with translation, with people on the move. So people would get to the border and they wouldn't be able to speak to anyone. And we, only, we had a limited number of translators. So we partnered with Google, who lent us some of their developers to create a specific translation app to deal with that. So I realize I may have been way over my time, but all of that to say that, you know, working with the private sector, working with entrepreneurs, is absolutely essential to the work that we do. And each and every one of you can actually do something. The key for the private sector and engaging the private sector is operating with them within the domain of your own expertise. If you're already a technology company, if you're already a company that provides education, or you already have the expertise that we're looking for, this is how we, we want to partner with you, and this is how you can contribute to this crisis. Thank you, Corinne. I think, um, so what we're looking at is we're looking at institutions opening up and working in new ways. Um, that innovation is being taken up and social enterprises are being looked at and partnered with by a UN agency is something that the UN hasn't seen in its 70 years worth of history. One other issue that Kareem touched on very much is, is, is local capacities, is that we are dealing with populations that are very educated populations and um, they, they, do want to, they do want to continue working. They do want to take their own livelihoods into their own hands. Ali's going to talk to us a little bit about the projects that Oxfam are doing that does exactly that, that, that goes into the field. And they do help local populations take their livelihoods into their hands, into their own hands, while providing essential resources. So Ali, if you give us a few minutes. Thank you. you know. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk on this occasion about innovation. So in Arabic, we say, Al-Haja Umm al which means necessity is the mother of innovation. So we believe in innovation, and the people always innovate to improve their life, to save their, li to save their lives. And the Syrian people are not exclusion. They, are, they follow the same. Uh, I was in Syria until 2012, and I witnessed some of the, I mean, uh, crisis before escalating to this current limit. And I see how the people were uh, creative and, and innovative in finding solutions to keep surviving. Like, uh, I am from the middle of Syria, uh, where it is under the government control till now. But even in this area, we have the electricity. It comes for one hour on and 23 hours off. So the people, you cannot live without electricity. So they use the car batteries developed system with low, with low cost and low consumption, and they are living till now with these car batteries, and they are creative, if you see how they are doing. They use the, the bicycles to charge mobiles. They use the plastic bags to uh, process and produce fuel in the BCH areas in Syria. We have like half a million people living in BCH. They don't have any connection with the world, so the people are creating ways to keep surviving. So, I mean, this is what you see. Uh, I was working with uh, United Nations when I was, uh, I mean, uh, until 2012, and my work included transportation along the country <coughs> in conflict uh, cities. So in the United Nations, we have a security system. Every day in the morning, they give us the letter. And my work includes going Homs, Aleppo, Hama, Damascus, and all conflict areas. And I have to travel by a UN car, and it was very risky. I, at the beginning, I used to depend on the information I was receiving from UN. Then I found it is sometimes five hours late. So how to do, I mean, I need a solution. I have to travel. So I uh, developed a, a, a relation with a public transportation private company in my hometown. He has the most updated uh, flow of information in the country. So every day in the morning, I call him. So how is it? Is Aleppo safe to go on this road? It is not. I mean, he has very updated, more than the United Nations system. I mean, he developed his own network. So the people are creative, innovative, and they can find ways to live and to survive. So I mean, these are the people. When it comes to humanitarian system, the issue is not only the creative ideas or the innovative ideas, is to establish or to initiate a system that allow these innovative ideas to be scaled, to be sustainable, to improve the humanitarian sector. 
So Oxfam, especially one of the organizations, the leading organization that call for changing the humanitarian system. We believe in the capacities of the local actors and we are uh, trying to influence more and more the uh, humanitarian system to give more opportunities to the local actors. If you look at the summit, last summit, they call for giving 25% of the local, of the aid to the local actors. However, you find 75% of the aid inside Syria went through the local actors. However, they received 0.3% of the cash aid. So it is not easy and we need creation to develop this, uh, the system that will help these people to work more effectively. For Oxfam, we are working in the region and we are working globally. Uh, I would like to mention some of our experiences. One of them is working with the Syrian people, uh, diaspora like in the US, including Karam and the other foundation, they were the first to respond to the crisis and they developed uh, organizations and networks and coalitions that they are doing great job inside Syria. So for us, they are one of the local actors. We, are, so we started a process of partnership with them like one year ago, trying to help with organizational capacities, more advocacy, more technical skills, what is needed for these people to work. They have the assets, we can strengthen here and there do some intervention. So this is one of the uh, experiences how you can work with local actors indirectly. So, I mean, they are inside, outside the country. Uh, one of the issues like uh, in Jordan and Lebanon, the refugee population is about 30% in Lebanon of the population, there are tensions, there are lack of resources. And like in Jordan, there is a critical problem with water. Jordan is the second poorest country in the world in water resources. So they have now one million Syrians, so it adds to the, their original problem with water, and they have bad practices in water management. So Oxfam started a pilot project last year to integrate the hosting community with the refugee community, with the ministry, with the government of Jordan, with international organizations like Oxfam. So we are working now on a project to improve the water management in Jordan and with a special focus on gender and on women because women are the key consumer at home. So, I mean, they stay at home and they consume the water. So it starts from bottom up. This means building capacities of the women and of the household and allow them to contribute to building the management of water, of water system. It is not uh, up-down. This hopefully will help 40,000 men, women, and boys and girls to be introduced, uh, incorporated in this project, uh, project that will help to build a system that will listen to the people. Another project I would like to talk about is the Recycle Project. It is a pilot project we started last year. Uh, in Syria, we have, before the crisis, we have uh, developed recycling uh, system in the country and we have people collecting and dealing with the private sector. In Jordan, they are less, I mean, they have less experience on this. So in Zarqa and uh, in the uh, refugee camps, there is a critical problem with management of waste uh, in the, the camps and we can benefit of these waste. So we developed a system building on the Syrian people experience. The lead of this is one of the who work in Syria in the recycling uh, sector for 12 years. So he was one of the refugees in that camp. So we developed a system, now they are collecting. We did raising awareness for uh, recycling raising awareness about this and creating a collective system in the camp. And uh, this manager of the camp, I mean, he's collecting and we connect the people with the private sector in Jordan. So with this, you are, uh, I mean, benefiting uh, with a project that climate uh, friendly and it will help the Syrian refugees. It created job opportunities, about 15, mostly for women and you are uh, doing things, I mean, that benefit the social, the, the camp and the uh, social, uh, I mean, the private sector. And with this, you decrease the tension between the hosting communities and the refugee communities. I think I took more than my time. No, no, perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> now, I, 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 thank you very much. I, 
I think what we're, what we're accomplishing here is we're kind of giving you a, a bit of a cornucopia of, of what, what the um, solutions are that are out there. We, we often talk about innovation, and innovation is a confusing word, and it's become a bit of a buzzword. But what we're really talking about are localized solutions. Um, Ali and, and what they're doing at Oxfam is they, if you kind of think through the problem set, they, they identify problems very quickly, and you know this as social entrepreneurs, is the clearer your problem set is, the easier it is to develop an enterprise around it. Um, so those of you that are thinking about potentially launching uh, a social enterprise, there are models that Oxfam is developing. Um, if you're looking for experience, these are the types of things that you would study to do. When we're looking at um, UNHCR, there's um, partnerships and collaboration. You know, you can't do it alone. You will never be able to do it alone. So the more you start to think about bringing in outside collaborators to the work you're doing, the better your work is going to do. Secondly, in terms of scale, start thinking immediately in, in, in how you're going to collaborate with other people to achieve scale, uh, because you do need other types of services, expertise, and um, resources at your disposal. Lena's really talking about disruption. Uh, these are smaller, lighter, agile institutions. A lot of you are at the head of these types of institutions, and um, the, the entire system needs disruption. Uh, the, the old folks in the system, they, they won't be as open to it, but you have to keep pushing, you have to keep thinking about it. I think at this moment we're pretty happy uh, to open up to some questions, uh, very pointed questions if, if, you'd, if you'd like. Um, if not, I have a couple of questions. We've got one here. Yes, sir, please. Hi, I'm Jason Cass with Toilets for People, and uh, we make low-cost composting toilets for off-grid situations like people in camps or people in rural areas. And my question is in terms of the getting um, availability to small organizations such as mine to do work in large camps or through the UN or, or maybe even to partner with Oxfam, are there any particularly good avenues that you could recommend for a small organization to take to disrupt and break into that structure? Do we have a volunteer to take on the question? I'll, I'll, I'll try. Go ahead, <laughs> I'll, I'll follow up on you. Um, yeah, it, 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 there is, it is possible, absolutely, and, and it's something that we welcome, and I think the, the beauty of, of having an innovation unit inside of a, a UN agency is for these kinds of collaborations to, to be incubated because the reality is as a very small company or organization, it would be much harder for you to you know, become a vendor per, per se to, to UN agency. But the beauty of having the innovation unit is we try to triage these relationships and you know, as Jay mentioned, we were very much on a we were very much on a problem focus level. So if there really is a need and we find that you have a solution that can work, yes, we absolutely do want to work with you to to test it. Yeah, I'll add to that if if I can get the mic. I, I think what we're at and what's really exciting about this social innovation movement is we're still in the nascent stages, to be to be entirely honest. And we've borrowed a lot from technology and other uh, spaces. One thing that we're seeing now is um, growth and scale through acquisition. The UN, I work with all of the innovation units within the UN system, and they've asked me for to develop a portfolio um, so that they can come in a registry of where, when they have a need, they can look and see what the social innovations, um, it, what, what's out there, what exists, and what they can possibly acquire. And now acquisition means something differently in our space. It doesn't mean capital acquisition. You're not going to become a billionaire, but you're probably not in this business to become a billionaire anyway. Um, we will be talking at a later stage of what, what that data crunch or what that crunch base will look like. Uh, that's part of the reason I'm here with, with um, Classy because Classy is, is a big player in this space and we're working with Classy to develop that type of work. Is there another question out there? <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to ask for the microphones to help us keep order because, um, yeah. Hi there. Hi, Christine Mahoney. I'm with the University of Virginia. I've been doing field work in, uh, for the past seven years in conflict zones in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and I've done field work in refugee camps and IDP camps. I have a book coming out in July called Failure and Hope, and it's advocating for uh, investment in microfinance for refugee entrepreneurs, as well as IDP entrepreneurs, as well as host community entrepreneurs. Um, because I think that we need to begin supporting both the host communities as well as the displaced in rebuilding their lives. And I was just wondering, we were just at the humanitarian um, 
uh, summit in Istanbul, and many people were talking about the difficulty of transferring money. Um, it seems Western Union's been the only one successful at doing it. So I was just wondering if you have any uh, kind of high-level advice. We're going to be building out a platform, a campaign, um, and essentially a kiva for the displaced entrepreneurs. So, uh, as we said, we, we believe in empowering local actors. One of the key issues that exclude the local actors is the transferring system. It is one of the innovative ideas, but when you put it in practice, you have the counter-terrorism legislation, which prevents most of the organizations to receive money. Now, for us as Oxfam, it is part of the advocacy uh, uh, categories. We are working heavily on it. And last week, I was in meetings in DC with Oxfam, I mean advocacy team, and with some of the Syrian people who are in visit. We facilitated the linkage, and now we are trying to work uh, closely with all the relevant parties on developing how we can empower this, the local actors to overcome this. We know the security, I mean, uh, reasons, but if you are, if you want to empower the local actors, one of the key issues they suffer from is the transferring system currently. So we are working on the advocacy, and we hopefully will have some good results, I mean. Hi, um, my name is Peter. I'm from Germany. Um, I'd like to address what uh, Karina said about um, losing human capital. Um, that's true. I, I totally agree with you, but we've benefited from that in Germany. We've got 1.1 million refugees in Germany who we um, are actually building. My, my company is building a, a training facility for uh, the Syrian refugees because unfortunately they are very well, well, fortunately they're very well educated, but unfortunately they're what they've learned is not um, re uh, recognized. And this, um, this, this training facility that we're, we're building, we're, we're hoping to, um, to, 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 to make the people welcome from, from Syria and so forth so that they, because with, with receiving education and getting a job, you have your self-esteem back. Um, but um, my question is a little bit directed, similar to like what this gentleman here is. We, we got a German company who gave us five million euros, which is somewhere around, I don't know, five, five and a half million dollars at the moment. But that's kind of peanuts, I guess you could call it, uh, in, in, in respect that we need to build several of these training facilities for 1.1 million you know, people. Is there any way to, 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 to link with, with somebody who may be interested with this, with this, this con earth-friendly construction company that we have in Germany for building these training facilities? Is there any way to link to help get these people educated and jobs and so forth? Yeah, the, the sound isn't so great, so I, I didn't hear yeah. everything you said because the sound isn't so great. Um, but yes, I mean, when I talked about loss of human capital, I mean for the person fleeing themselves, if they don't have any way to find livelihoods or be educated, it is a loss for them. But initiatives like yours make it a gain for the society, so absolutely. I think you were asking about linking with an organization like mine for, for your initiative. Is that what I heard? Yeah. 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 Well, I'll, I'll jump in as well. Um, I think when, when we're talking about the issues of scale, and as social entrepreneurs, <clears throat> we have to look at the, the potential for scale, right? So whenever we develop a solution and we have a solution that's de demonstrating impact, your first level is your local authorities, right? Because local authorities, through their procurement process, will be looking to deal with these solutions. So um, local th authorities, if you've already built at the city level, then you're looking at national, regional levels. Then there's the national government, which is procurement. These are extensions of the UN system. The UN system is a representation of national governments. So once you've conquered or once you uh, have scaled to a national level, it's at that national level that you can demonstrate impact and then we start talking to the UN and we start talking to larger organizations that would look to replicate what you're doing. So there's, there's kind of a process within the ecosystem that, that looks out and I'm happy to give you a little bit more um, on that after, after the talk. We've got another question. Yes, sir. And, Hi. and then followed over here to the left. Hi, my name is Kim. I run something called the Humanitarian Innovation oh, Kim. Fund. Yes, how are you doing, Kim? I'm doing well. <laughs> um, 
I think it's great. I like the idea of people, people ideas. I think we need to recognize that migration has been the most successful strategy ever for people to lift themselves out of poverty, um, basically leaving farms and going to cities to work. But if we're talking about refugees, we need to recognize that they're coming under particular legal frameworks, which, whilst offering them certain protections, also often mean they can't work, they don't have recourse to normal democratic authorities. And um, I was actually in Jordan a couple of weeks ago and was lucky enough to visit the recycling project that you were talking about. And it was really fascinating talking to the people running that about how successful it had been, how um, empowered the people who were um, doing the waste collecting felt but they were doing it on a cash for work basis because they're not allowed to work, they're, they're not allowed to have employment. And Oxfam was facing a quandary because it was now becoming more successful, it was generating income over and above costs. They weren't able to share that equity with the people who were contributing to it because of the legal frameworks. So my question is this, if we're talking about really capitalizing on uh, the resources that refugees have to offer, is that gonna be through working with and within the current legal structures or by trying to disrupt and change them? So is it gonna be reform or revolution? So actually we work with the current system and trying to change the system also at the same time. So the first, I mean the model, I think it is successful because it is built, building relationship with the uh, local market system. You are not creating a new system and this is one of the advantages. Still, there are many restrictions for the Syrian refugees to work in Jordan, and we have a big advocacy team who works and raising awareness. There is another project I did not talk about, is the Voices of Syrian People, which actually work in collaboration with the uh, Jordan uh, Women Union in uh, uh, empowering the voices of the Syrian people about legal, legal issues, about improving their uh, work rights, which will allow them to do more work and to scale up more. So the things are not ready 100%, and there are many challenges, and we are trying with other organizations to make not a full reform, but whatever we can do necessary to, to change and to make this project and other projects more successful. Uh, Thank you. Can I say Just, something about this? Yeah, one second. I just want to let everyone know that Kim actually runs a very successful innovation fund, so he can also address some of the questions we're running here. If you want to add here, um, we just have one comment. The question of what, if we need a revolution, we absolutely do need a revolution in humanitarian aid systems. I think Syria, another thing that people should understand about Syria, if you want to think about it as um, just a case study, of what has happened over the past five years and what potentially could happen anywhere in the world um, at, with a conflict at this, at, at this level and with the mass displacement and the violence is that Syria really isn't about Syria anymore. It's about these global problems that happen and what Syria has proven that the systems in place on all levels have failed. Um, failed because they cannot sustain this kind of devastation at this scale. And for instance, in Jordan, Zaatari camp, people, when the, when the UNHCR set up Zaatari camp, Syrians were not like other refugees that had been, that people have worked with before. It's a different time, it's a different place, it's a different type of people coming in and becoming displaced. And as, um, as the director of the Zaatari camp said, we came to build a camp and Syrians came to build a city. Um, the, we are seeing this also in, in refugees in Turkey. We're seeing it actually inside Syria where people are innovating every single day, trying to sustain themselves. We're seeing it in Germany um, and how people are even trying to get to Europe in innovative ways and risking their lives to do that. And so I think the bigger question is, is that are we going to sit in 2016 and say that people are People have to, to risk their lives and their children's lives and get in a leaky boat spending the last few thousand dollars they have of their, of their income. This is middle, Syria's middle class to get on a boat to prove their worth to get to Europe because they don't have the right passport, because we don't have systems in place to process refugees in host countries and have them pay. They will gladly pay for air, airplane tickets to get to where they want to without having to lose their children or dying on the way or leaving without arriving to a new country with absolutely nothing because you physically can't hold it. 
These are the things that are happening right now every single day to Syrians, and it's the global responsibility and people, like entrepreneurs and innovators' responsibility to say, no, enough is enough of this. We have to figure out solutions because the status quo is not acceptable. And it's happening today in Syria. Five years from now, it's going to happen elsewhere unless we fix the systems. So I think, yes, we do need a revolution. If I can just ask for uh, indulgence, that is definitely worth applauding. We, I promised two more questions. Um, we've hit our time limit. Um, if we, oh, we, just one question. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. We just have to, um, one, one last question here, and um, we'll move on. Hi, I'm Erica Sapphire. I'm a scientist at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. As people move, so do our pathogens. On the few dollars that are available, what are some of the strategies that you have seen that have been successful in identifying and solving expected and unexpected infectious disease cases? Um, and if we could just keep questions or answers really brief or run really short in time. Okay. Some examples of um, low resource solutions in, in infectious disease, yeah. I mean, one example is what we're, we do this program called Sponsor a Syrian Family. It's very um, affordable. It's very low cost when you talk about the numbers of what it costs to be able to take care of a, a crisis of this scale. It costs $1,200 to teach a Syrian refugee child to, for, to go to school for an entire year. And we're spending over $10 million a day bombing ISIS and failing. So there's many, many things that you can do with a very large impact and deep impact that you could scale up in terms of education. And we do a program where we uh, take children out of child labor and give the family a cash monthly stipend so that they can survive. And the child goes to school and the family is able to sustain itself. We've done this for now for a year and the kids lives immediately change when they stop working for 12 hours a day for almost no income and are now going to school and the family is, is, is stabilized. And we believe that this is a way to keep these people from actually having to make that choice to get on a boat and to leave to Europe because at the end, refugees really want to return home. Okay. Well, um, we unfortunately can't take any more questions here on stage, but we're more than happy to answer some of your questions off stage and throughout the rest of the conference. And I just want to thank the panelists one more time for coming here and thank you for um, giving us your, your attention and your time. And we're very happy to answer any questions after the panel. Thank you. Thank you.